of that. Right now in the parking and the parking lot end of that, but there's a good Wi-Fi, oh, there's a good phone connection here, so I'll stop here until we're done. But, but still it's in the 90s in terms of Welcome everyone to day two of the Israeli Water Reuse Virtual Event. My name is Joe Vizi, and I am the Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer at Xylem and a member of the Water Reuse Association Board of Directors. The Water Reuse Association is pleased to work with our Israeli and State Department colleagues on Action 11.1 .1 of the National Water Reuse Action Plan, facilitating U.S.-Israeli collaboration on water reuse. The Water Reuse Association is a leading partner with EPA and others in implementing action items recommended in the National Water Reuse Action Plan. Today's event is a good example of how the Water Reuse Association is working with our partners to share knowledge and best practices in water reuse underway in other countries with utilities, technology providers, businesses, and other stakeholders developing and operating water reuse programs here in the U.S. Yesterday, we heard from Israeli Ambassador Gilad Erdan, an acting EPA Assistant Administrator for Office of International and Tribal Affairs, Jane Nishida, and other Israeli water leaders about Israel's policy and regulatory framework for water reuse projects. Now, today's event will spotlight Israeli approaches to specific implementation and technology challenges for water reuse projects. We will hear about successful Israeli case studies, followed by a moderated panel hosted by Dr. Rabia Chadra of the US EPA. Before we get started, we have a few logistical notes for you. We recommend opening the chat feature to find further information and links to additional resources. Please feel free to use the Q&A box to submit questions to any of the presenters, and we will try to answer them uh, as time allows and as they come in. And finally, following the event, you will receive an email with links to the session recordings, contact information, and additional questions. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's webinar, Omir Bob, with the Economic and Trade Mission at the Embassy of Israel. Thank you for joining us, and over to you, Omir. Good morning, colleagues in the U.S., and good evening, colleagues in Israel and in many more countries that are with us today. Um, thank you so much, Joe, for the important opening uh, remarks and emphasizing the importance of our collaboration on water reuse. Uh, my name is Omer Bab, um, and I'm the Director of Regulatory Affairs at the Economic and Trade Mission in the Embassy of Israel in Washington, D.C., and a member of the International Collaboration Team of the Water Reuse Action Plan. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank EPA, Water Reuse Association, FDA, and USDA for the great partnership and the ongoing collaboration with Israel. Also, to, thanks, to thank speakers and audience for participating in the first of its kind Water Reuse virtual tour to Israel. In the last five months, dozens of leading experts from the US and Israel analyzed together intersecting and shared fields of water reuse aspects in both countries based on, water, on the water reuse action plan. This conference is one of the outcomes of, the, uh, of this process. As Joe mentioned, after discussing yesterday policy and regulation uh, frameworks that allow Israel to reuse 87% of its water, the purpose of today's discussion is to discuss the implementation of water reuse practices. This, this time will allow us to focus only on selected topics which will demonstrate and discuss financing aspect of uh, water reuse, the case study of uh, Shafdan, uh, the largest water, wastewater treatment plant uh, in Israel with Mekorot, overcoming challenges, deploying a cutting edge, uh, with deploying cutting edge technologies with uh, leading tech experts, a key example for US-Israel bilateral collaborative uh, model for water reuse innovation, 
Um, and last, as mentioned, we'll have a joint discussion on selected question moderated by um, EPA to highlight the intersecting and joint fields of our countries. Please feel free and welcome to use the Q&A box, uh, box to raise questions. Our panelists and a team of additional experts will do their best to answer as much as they can. We'll open our day with a brief overview, uh, with a brief overview of the development of water we use in, in Israel and, and the integrated water, resource, water resources management approach. I am delighted to introduce Danny Greenwald, Senior Deputy Director General for Regulation at the, at the Israel Water Authority. Danny, please, the floor is yours. Okay, glad to be with you, Danny Greenwald from Israeli Water Authority. We are the regulator of the uh, Israeli water sector. Um, whoever heard me yesterday, uh, feel free to uh, go take a cup of coffee. Uh, everyone else, happy to have you on board. Good morning to everyone in the States and good late afternoon for everyone in Israel. Okay, please flip the, flip the slide. We'll be talking today, another one please. We'll be talking today about the Israeli experience with reclaimed wastewater use. We'll do it brief about nine to 10 minutes. Flip please. Where is Israel? What is Israel? Israel is in the Middle East. Uh, um, we're along the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, um, we have a long shore with the Mediterranean Sea, which is helpful uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, this desalination of seawater. Um, the geography is that in the north, it is rainy and, and relatively a lot of water. And in the south, where I am right this moment, it is a desert. Uh, the rain is only in the, the, uh, in the, in the winter, and we have uh, about eight months of the summer with no rain. And for this, we use, uh, and this influences our use of water. Please flip. The Israeli population is growing rapidly. Since the 1960s, we've, uh, uh, four, the population has grown four times based on uh, um, a lot of immigration to Israel and on uh, uh, um, a very high birth rate. Now, the meaning of our population growing rapidly is meaning we constantly need more water sources to support the population. And we're constantly building infrastructures to adapt our system to the growing population. Flip, please. Um, when we take our balance of water between natural sources and what we need, then we are short about 45% of the amount of water we have. Now, the use of water per capita in Israel is low or, or medium low, 170 liters per, per, per capita, which means that uh, uh, um, we can save water, but it won't get us. We have to, we've, already come quite a long way and there we can't make a very big difference in that. So we are constantly looking for new water sources. And, and for this reason, the reclaimed wastewater has been very, uh, uh, um, very important in Israel. Flip please. So what is water used for in Israel? Um, about half the water is used for irrigation, agricultural irrigation. And it is not used all around the year because we have a wet season of four to five months where there is almost no use of, of uh, 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 water for irrigation. So all the water is used in summer when it's dry. And this very much influences our pattern of use. We have about 45% of water uh, used for households and industry. 6% is supplied to neighbors. The neighbors is the Palestinian Authority and to uh, uh, the Kingdom of Jordan. Uh, Kingdom of Jordan, we also buy water from, but we supply more than more, more than we buy from. Um, so our main use of water in Israel is agriculture, and this is will uh, you will see later on how this influenced our use in wastewater. That we took the wastewater use to agriculture and not to potable water, as many places in the states are thinking today. Flip, please. Why are we using treated wastewater? Why have we started? And I've talked that we've been using new wastewater since the 1960s. Uh, uh, this is a very long-term practice, and, and we see the advantages. We're turning an obstacle into a resource, and resource of water in Israel is very important. I mentioned that we are short of water, and we've, the shortage is, is always growing. Um, we can maintain fresh water sources and to use it for the population as drinking water, as potable water. This improves the health and environment because wastewater we did not use, treated wastewater, we would uh, dispose it into rivers and creeks. We, it's an economic growth engine because the water is used for agriculture and agriculture 
uh, uh, can, is, is part of our economy. It's a cost effective uh, water supply. We have many, many advantages which we use. You can see them on the slide. Flip, please. All together, when we wrap it up, what we've done until now, and there's been a lot of governmental support in sewage infrastructures and sewage collections and sewage treatment and, and, and uh, in uh, supply systems. And we've come to a situation today that we're using mainly for agriculture, almost 500 million, million cubic meters of water per year, which is about 85 to 87, depending on the year, percent of the sewage manufactured. Uh, and, and almost all of it is used for agriculture in this balances up our, 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 our water budget. Um, as you can see on the, on the, in the bottom left of the slide, um, the growth in amount of sewage and the amount of treated sewage and the amount of reclaimed water is rapidly going as our population is constantly growing. Next slide, please. So what are our steps and the conditions that we are using if we want to use reclaimed wastewater? First of all, you, we have the integrated management of our water system. I talked about it yesterday. We combined the, the use of, of uh, uh, potable water or high quality water and wastewater, treated wastewater and uh, desalinated water from the sea. We can combine the system to use it uh, uh, the most efficiently. We have a lot of regulation and support systems towards building the sewage systems, the collecting the sewage and taking care of the sewage. Obviously, if you didn't collect the sewage and you didn't treat it, then of course you couldn't, you can't use it. We have regulation on disposals of substances into the sewage, which will influence the potential of using them. If well, if salts will be disposed into the sewage, then we can't use them for agriculture. If uh, a detergent will be disposed into the into the sewage, then the treatment plants won't work uh, properly. We have a lot of regulation on this, and we do it as an economical regulation with a with a, a tariff system which, which meets the, the, the quality of the water passed to the, uh, to the price that the industry will pay. Flip, please. We have regulation on sewage treatment. Uh, the responsibility of treating the sewage in Israel is on the sewage producers. So we will uh, have it, make sure that they will be able, that they will take care of the sewage as appropriate. A lot of research, a lot of research on how we can use the wastewater uh, uh, for agriculture, uh, different uh, 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 rootstocks, different soils, different crops. Mainly, we'll hear about this tomorrow when uh, when we will uh, have a lot of we will work with the uh, Israeli uh, um, agricultural ministry, and we have regulations on every wastewater user done by the uh, health ministry in Israel to make sure that every plot and plot is used in such a way that it is not dangerous to the population. Flip, please. We are having an increasing uh, uh, growth in the number of wastewater treatment plants. This is the number of large, or what we call in Israel, large treatment plants. You have to remember that the Israeli population is small. We're talking about nine to nine and a half million people. Uh, in the last uh, uh, 20 years or 25 years, almost all the treatment plants have changed to uh, uh, variations of activated sludge and uh, the quality of the wastewater is improving and this way we can use we can use it we're using our water for i remember uh, I'll, I'll specify again we're using our water for agriculture we are not bringing the water to potable quality we are, it is a lower quality and we are using it in a separate transfer system uh based on each quality Philip, please Um, so how do we do this? In the 1960s, we started it as a private uh, 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 local uh, um, um, initiatives. Uh, yesterday, we had uh, the speech from Emek Hefer when he showed how they did it, how they did it and how they started. Um, in the 1980s, we want to expand it. So we did it, the, the development was done by Mekorot, which is a, a governmental uh, company, a national company. In this way, the government could take the, the responsibility of they could take the risk of, of building the systems and making sure that we can supply the water low cost to farmers and convince farmers to use the water. Since the nine, uh, since year 2000, the development is being done by the private sector when they are getting subsidized from the government for the infrastructure, when uh, uh, the subsidies are based on the external costs, which uh, uh, the farmers do not gain from them, but as a society, we gain from them. Next, please. 
Overall, we have two main ways of using the water. Again, in separate, system, separate supply systems, it comes with the quality. On the right side, you can see a system of uh, direct use. Uh, the water, wastewater is manufactured all the year. It's treated all the year as we need the irrigation mainly in the dry season. Then we will collect them in, in open reservoirs where we accumulate the water all, uh, uh, all the winter. And we use it during the summer. And, and on the left side, you can see a map. Uh, uh, in the northern part, the, the, the color is uh, direct use. And in the southern part, you can see uh, the areas where the water is from a, a uh, non-direct system. And we will talk about it later on. It is the Shaftan. Flip, please. A structure will usually look as, as, as we can see here. We will have a treatment plant. We will have a seasonal reservoir. We will have a pumping station and, uh, and pipe system to deliver the water to the uh, end users. And we have, we'll have the consumers. In this case, we're talking about agriculture. And all the, all the green you can see around the reservoir, it is all irrigated from treated wastewater, uh, um, including uh, crops that are eaten. And, and uh, this system works and works well. Philip, please. The change we've been doing in the last uh, 10 years is we are uh, um, connecting our supply systems. It used to be that every town had its own treatment plant and, and had its own waste uh, and own system for treat treating the wastewater farmers in this area. We found that in most areas, they're either too much treated wastewater, which they can't use, or too little. And in the last few years, we've been connecting them to regional. Uh, supply systems that they can add and they can transfer or receive from neighbors. We do not do it on a national level because we do not have a need in the national level. We have a national system for, for uh, potable water, but not for treated wastewater. The treated wastewater is used in a regional supply system. Flip, please. Um, tariffs, I won't touch now because Gilad Fernandez will talk about it right after me. Flip, please. We managed to do all this because of the Israeli regulation. The Israeli regulation is that uh, um, the water is owned by the by the by the popular pub, by the public and is run by the state. And as we can run the state and we can make this easy, we can transfer water water from different types from area to area, and we can really determine the market. Something is quite different than the American situation. Flip, please. Um, the Israeli water sector is run today by a water board, which is one table that all the decisions are made by. The table has professional representatives of our governmental agencies, like the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Agriculture, of course, the Water uh, Authority, and two uh, members of come from the public. And all the legislation is made in on this table, and this is, enables us to really have a, make a policy and carry it out. Next, please. To sum it up, in the la and during 15 years or 20 years from since the 90, late 90s, uh, uh, where most of the water supplied in Israel was potable, high quality water from natural sources, which we didn't have enough. Today, we're talking about only 35% of the water being supplied as natural potable water. And all our other water sources are, are either uh, low quality natural water or reclaimed, uh, reclaimed wastewater or water from uh, um, uh, sea desalination. And as the time goes by, we will see more and more sea desalination, more and more treated wastewater and our natural sources, the quantity will probably say the same, but the percentage will go and decrease. Next slide, please. Okay, this is our experience uh, um, very, very briefly, and you will continue now with uh, uh, um, the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Danny, for a fascinating presentation, actually summarizing um, day one of uh, this uh, virtual tour and clarifying the need for water we use in Israel, the challenges, the set of consideration for water policy, and the integrated water resource management approach that allow using different standards of water in an efficient, uh, efficient way. Uh, Flip, please. Our next discussion will focus on challenges and mechanisms for financing water and sewage uh, infrastructure. I am pleased to invite, invite Gilad Fernandez, Deputy Director General for Economics at the Israel Water Authority. Gilad, please. 
Hi. Um, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I hope you saw, you see me. Now you see me. Yeah. Just a second. I will hear you and I start. Okay. So uh, we are going to talk about the uh, financing of the water sector in Israel in this, uh, uh, in our project. Uh, the next slide, please. Oh, another one. Okay, so as uh, you can see, and I think it uh, will uh, discuss uh, in the previous session, Israel is about uh, 9 million uh, people. We have uh, a, a water revenue volume about $3 billion per year. The next slide, please. And uh, in this slide, you can see the water uh, supply revolution. Uh, in uh, 15 years, now it's almost uh, 20 years, uh, we, we're going from 50% uh, of the total consumption, our uh, manufactured water. It's uh, a very, very expensive uh, reform, but we think it's uh, very uh, efficient and uh, it's, uh, it uh, enables the irrigation of the agriculture in Israel and uh, all, the all the consumer can consume uh, the water they need to do. The next slide, please. The challenges in the financing water and sewage uh, infrastructure in Israel, uh, Danny said uh, before that we have a rapid population growth and uh, we also have a decline in the natural water uh, sources. And uh, we have to desalination the seawater, which is uh, more expensive, uh, more expensive than the, the natural water. Uh, we have also a, a full recycling treated in the wastewater uh, and, uh, for agriculture and uh, industrial use. Uh, we update the effluent uh, treatment plants. Uh, to the tertiary level uh, with no use limitation. Uh, it's called it's, uh, in Israel uh, tertiary level. Uh, we have time lag in uh, replacing uh, uh, old infrastructure uh, in the urban sector. And of course, we have a lot of uh, political pressure uh, to reduce water tariff because uh, it's a very uh, essential need. Uh, and everybody said it uh, should be cheap than uh, it's now. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, now I will want to focus in the financing sources uh, in the investment in the water uh, sector in Israel. As you can see, we have uh, the chain supply, the, the chain supply uh, uh, which uh, has six parts. We talked about uh, we talk about production, transmission, uh, distribution water, and uh, in the next slide we see uh, and we can focus in the um, uh, part that uh, uh, connected to uh, of course collection and regional uh, transmission and wastewater treatment and recycling uh, effluent and uh, distribution. So, uh, in all the parts that we mentioned, we have a, a, part, a component in the tariff, uh, in the water tariff that uh, uh, enables the, to the supplier to take a loan from the banks and uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to pay the banks uh, the, the long-term uh, uh, loans. Uh, in the period of the infrastructure that, he, that everybody make, if it's uh, Mekorot, the national uh, water company in Israel, she, uh, she is a very strong uh, company uh, uh, and also uh, they have a rate of uh, AAA, which enables them to take a loan for a long term and uh, in low interest. 
and we also have a, the municipal co cooperation in the urban sector in Israel, which also can take a loan from the bank. They're not like Mekorot in the strong uh, in the economic aspect, but uh, they're strong enough to take a um, loan. Uh, in the regional transmission and the recycling uh, fluent, uh, it's not just a loan. We have also a government grant uh, that uh, enable uh, everybody to, uh, to establish the infrastructure because the capital cost is uh, very big and very high. Uh, and, I, and we think it's a very good uh, mechanism because uh, the combination of uh, component in the tariff and the, uh, a grant from the government uh, sometimes even a uh, loan from the government uh, enable uh, to um, enable to establish a very efficient uh, infrastructure in these uh, two parts of the chain uh, supply of water. The next slide, please. Uh, what are the characteristics of water and uh, sewage economy? First of all, uh, we talked about we talk about the uh, uh, economy of scale. Uh, when we have uh, big companies, uh, from one side they uh, can build uh, in more efficiency because the infrastructure serves more customers, and you can uh, build a very high uh, performance uh, infrastructure. In the other end, we don't want the uh, monopolies. Uh, so we have to find the right balance between these uh, two uh, characteristics. Also, uh, we talk about uh, uh, desalination agreement uh, that Danny uh, mentioned before. It's very important to emphasize that what enabled, uh, I think, huge success in Israel in the desalination uh, plants it's that uh, the contracts uh, uh, that the uh, bidder uh, sign is not with uh, uh, the, regu uh, the, regu uh, the regulator, the uh, regulator, regulator, uh, water authority. It's not with the uh, Macorot because uh, 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 much of uh, the finance came from uh, uh, banks from all over the world. And they don't know Mekorot, like we in Israel, it's a big company, but in the world, uh, uh, not, uh, no, nobody heard about it, this company. So the contract signed with the state of Israel. So uh, the banks uh, I think it's very um, security loan, and uh, they know that the state of Israel stand behind this contract, and it enables the finance of this uh, project, and also a uh, a low interest for uh, this project. Uh, in the urban sector, uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, entities, uh, which we call them uh, municipal uh, corporations. Um, we also have, of course, government loans and government grants. Uh, we have also uh, some uh, payment in the urban sector, which is mandatory just for the establish uh, the infrastructure. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, old picture. If uh, we are going to the next slide and we don't have uh, much time, I want to focus in the water treatment facilities. Uh, we have a, a method that we are, uh, the methodology of uh, recognized cost in these uh, facilities is uh, uh, regardless to the uh, uh, size of these facilities. Uh, you see in the table, the small and the large facilities and the type of the treatment uh, that uh, the plants do. Uh, we have a capital uh, cost, of course, and the operating uh, cost. And we try to, uh, to recognize this cost in the tariff in a normative way, way not uh, like a cost plus, uh, cost plus uh, method. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, works that uh, we do uh, to find what is the correction 
if I, the correct uh, cost if I, uh, if uh, somebody built it in a very efficiency uh, way. And uh, every plant of this treatment get uh, this uh, normative cost. Sometimes we, uh, there is a big uh, and unique uh, facilities like in the Shafdan. So uh, in this case, we are uh, uh, see the plants of the, this uh, planet, uh, of this plant, and uh, uh, we are, uh, 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 let's say, uh, observer in the tenders that they uh, made because we want to, uh, to ensure that uh, there is a competition uh, procedure uh, to choose the best, uh, uh, the best uh, proposal for these facilities. Uh, next, please. In the return of affluent, uh, we, we, we built uh, this facility with two uh, uh, main characteristics uh, that uh, we mean a, a government grant. The government grant is uh, about 60 percent, maybe sometimes more, uh, from the cost of the established uh, the facility. Uh, and if it's a grant, the, the farmers don't need to, uh, to return this grant. Um, and the other, uh, the other part of the capital, they take loans, and the farmers themselves establish uh, a uh, type of supply, we call uh, it uh, association. And they uh, try to do it in the very efficient way and they, must, uh, and they want to do it in the, the cheapest way. Uh, but we, of course, uh, regulated their tariff because we want to see that uh, they uh, have some uh, money to capital expend, uh, expenditure, which, we, which uh, will be in the, after the life cycle of this facility. We don't want that the association will be uh, with uh, no uh, equity uh, for the next um, investment. And the operation uh, cost, it's uh, of course uh, built from energy and some uh, treatment that they have to do. Uh, and that's also very, very efficient and very cheap. Uh, the next uh, slide, please. Uh, okay, I, I will uh, go to the uh, to the next slide because we don't have uh, any much time, uh, enough time. So I don't, I want to uh, show you this uh, regional effluent. As you can see, uh, the total uh, capital and operating it's about forty to forty five uh, cent uh, per cubic meter. Uh, it's much it, it's uh, much uh, cheapest than uh, cheapest than, uh, than the potable water for agriculture. So this uh, a lot of incentive to uh, irrigate with this water because they are very good water, the reliable uh, source uh, of water because the city uh, always using the in the water and we have uh, wastewater to treat, uh, and it's a very good uh, um, way to irrigate uh, uh, agriculture in Israel. And we, and we think we have uh, um, uh, one big advantage that Israel is a very small country. So all this infrastructure not, uh, are not very long. Uh, the agriculture farmers, uh, uh, the agriculture farms are uh, generally uh, very close to the facilities. In the Shafdan, it's not like this. It's about 90 kilometers from the the source of the wastewater treatment plant, but it's a very large uh, uh, treatment, uh, treatment plant to reuse. So they have economy of scale. So even that it's a, a long way to do, uh, but it's a, a huge amount of water. And uh, it's a very, uh, I think, efficient and cheap uh, way to irrigate agriculture in Israel. So if I uh, will summarize in the next slide, please. Another one. Oh, about the Shabdani, we will talk uh, separately. Another one. 
Also, also another one. Okay, if I just summarize the financing the difficulties or challenge, uh, the first uh, is about uh, the average asset life, which is uh, much uh, bigger than the loans. The loan in Israel, uh, uh, this facility is take, it's uh, uh, generally for 20, maybe 25 years. And we know that the facilities uh, can, uh, the, life, uh, uh, the life cycle, uh, uh, it's much longer. So we have in the first time of uh, in the tariff, uh, like a jump that uh, have to that we that have to uh, to take uh, the component of capital which is bigger uh, because they have to uh, to pay the loan just in twenty or twenty five years. Uh, generally, uh, we have uh, the gap. Uh, that we talked about. We have reg regulatory difficult uh, sometimes uh, in the supervisor of uh, banks who require a uh, guarantee for uh, loans to the urban uh, water op uh, corporation, but it's not uh, uh, regardless to the reuse uh, in, the in, the in these facilities. Uh, also, we have uh, the government uh, policy uh, to dispire population from the current population and the centers. And we know it's a very big uh, challenge in, uh, for the finance project. But I think uh, just one sentence uh, to summarize that uh, the method that uh, generally uh, most of the costs are normative and they, everybody have to pay them in the tariff, make it a very efficient way to allocate these uh, resources that we know uh, that uh, everybody wants them. Uh, and that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gilad, for highlighting the practices to overcome challenges of water we use financing. Financing, of course, is key policy aspect that allow Israel to overcome its uh, water sc uh, scarcity. And, uh, and thank you for this uh, uh, great overview. I uh, remind the audience that our Q&A box uh, is open uh, for question and you can raise any question to any of the panelists or uh, the forum and of course we'll emit all the panelists at, discussion at, the end, at the discussion at the end of the day. Um, one of the principles of the US-Israel collaboration on water reuse is to generate comprehensive scope of policy, science and technology uh, in the most practical manner. This this is moving us uh, to the next topic, exploring the case study of the Shafdan, the largest and multiple elements wastewater treatment plant in Israel, treating the a, a metropolitan area of Tel Aviv and actually irrigating the desert almost 100 kilometers away. Uh, next, 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 please. I'm delighted to invite Dr. Hadassah Anan, researcher of uh, effluent treatment and reuse in water quality division in, at uh, Mekorot, the national water company of Israel. Adas, please. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks, Omer, and thanks to the team, the organizing committee for inviting Mekorot um, to speak about its key role in uh, water reuse in Israel. Um, Efrat Cohen, the dance process engineer, was supposed to take part in delivering this talk, but unfortunately she is unable to join us. So I'll try to do a good enough job to make up for her absence. Um, you can um, move to the next one, please. Um, throughout the presentation, I'll highlight um, several of our challenges and strengths on which we would love to cooperate with uh, partners from different sectors throughout the US. Um, so before going any further, I'd like to use this opportunity to encourage you to approach us um, if you'd like to further the conversation of, on any of the topics I'll be mentioning um, or um, other topics um, for that matter. Um, so before we start talking about the Shafdan uh, wastewater treatment plant, I want to put things in context uh, and briefly repeat uh, key elements from, uh, from the talks we heard earlier and yesterday. Uh, mainly that uh, water use in Israel is primarily for agriculture use, 
Um, and here you can see the evolution of the different water sources for agriculture over the past uh, three and a half decades. Next. Um, and if you look at the and if you look at the effluent component, then uh, you can see it can be split into three main groups with respect to the quality, quality um, secondary effluent or lower quality, tertiary effluent, uh, and claimed water, which is produced exclusively at the Shaftan and will be the center of much of today's talk. Next. Um, so the Shafdan is owned by Igudan, which is the Dan Region Township Union, and it has been operated by Mikoot for uh, many decades now. Uh, it serves, like Omar just mentioned, the greater Tel Aviv metropolitan area, approximately, it serves approximately two and a half million people and handles a flow of about uh, 100 mil million gallons um, a day. Next. Um, one of the key principles uh, Mekorot and Igudan try to follow in operating and selecting technologies for the Shafgan is that of a circular economy. Um, we try to avoid waste formation and to make sure that um, we use each and every aspect of the raw material that enters the plant uh, with the raw sewage. Next. Um, maximizing the circularity of the process um, requires examining it as a whole. So starting with the potable water that are consumed by the humans that produce the wastewater. Um, so just to describe a few examples, um, our reuse is for agriculture. And in our early days, we had a problem with high boron concentrations um, in, in the effluent, which was hurting the crops. So it turned out that one of the main contributors uh, to boron uh, in the wastewater were laundry detergents. So we had to limit the amount of boron um, allowed in our detergents to allow this extensive reuse for agriculture. Um, another example is uh, the reduction in the salinity of the effluent, which, which had a, a positive influence on agriculture that came along with um, switching our potable water source from groundwater and Sea of Galilee to, uh, to, to desalinated seawater. Um, so following this kind of attention to de details, uh, we're able to um, we use the sludge as a fertilizer to generate biogas during uh, anaerobic digestion and then um, use it to produce energy for the plant and of course uh, produce reclaimed water for um, agriculture use. Next. Um, when we describe the Shafdan, we actually look at um, five different plants. We have the pretreatment and then uh, activated sludge based bioreactors that produce uh, partially nitrified secondary effluent. Then if we look at the liquid line, then the secondary effluent undergoes soil aquifer treatment to produce reclaimed water. And if we look at the solid line, then the sludge from the bioreactors goes through a thermophilic anaerobic dig digestion at uh, 55 degrees C, which produces biogas and class A sludge that then undergoes uh, thickening and watering uh, before it is uh, supplied. Next, please. Um, if we look at the uh, products of the solid line, then um, we, produce, we produce about 880,000 pounds of sludge daily um, we, at approximately 20% uh, uh, with approximately 20% dry matter content. Next. And with respect to biogas production, um, we produce about uh, 26 million uh, gallons daily. Um, of natural, of natural gas that contains about 60% uh, methane. And that gas is then used for heating, heating the bioreactors and uh, for energy production. It is able to supply approximately 70% of the plant's electricity demands. And we would be able to go up to 80 if and when we start selling excess electricity to the electricity network. Next, please. Um, if we switch back to the liquid line, then as mentioned before, Mekorot takes the secondary effluent produced by the, by the Shafgan wastewater treatment plant and applies soil aquifer treatment, or as I'll be referring to it from here on, SAT, um, to produce reclaimed water. So what is soil aquifer treatment? What is SAT? Um, in SAT, we take the secondary effluent and infiltrate it into the Israeli coastal aquifer through a series of dedicated um, infiltration basins. The infiltrated effluent remains um, in a managed and isolated area of the aquifer for a period ranging between a few months to more than two years. The average is between six and 12 months. 
um, after which they are produced through dedicated wells and supplies to farmers in the in the Negev region in the south of Israel for agriculture use um, as reclaimed water. Next, please. The infiltration process is intermittent and it involves a wetting and drying cycle to assure the top layer of the soil has oxidizing conditions, uh, which are needed for maximizing the water quality benefits that can be achieved through this treatment. Next, please. Um, here you can see an example of the very high water quality that is typical of the SAT and has been since um, its initial operation nearly 40 years ago. Um, because of the very high quality uh, and the extreme reliability and robustness of the process, the regulation for the application of reclaimed water are less stringent than, that we than what we have for tertiary effluent uh, and are more similar to those that are typical for irrigation with potable water. So for example, um, yesterday uh, was mentioned that um, there's a need for a dedicated permit for irrigating with, uh, with tertiary effluent. Um, that kind of permit is not needed when, when using potable water for irrigation, and it's not needed when you're using reclaimed water either, which means a lower regulatory bur burden on the growers that are using these particular, this particular water quality, which of course is a benefit. Next, please. Um, here we can see the microbial quality um, of the reclaimed water, which again has been consistent for several decades now. And um, it demonstrates again, the robustness and the high reliability of the SAT in removing pathogens. And this quality is achieved just by, just through the soil aquifer treatment itself. Uh, the reclaimed water later on undergo chlorination before being supplied for reuse. Next, please. So, um, what, so what's next? Um, as David Weinberg from the Ministry of Health mentioned yesterday, um, the SAT is at its capacity and uh, we need an alternative solution for producing more reclaimed water without creating new infiltration basins that are just not available. So to achieve that, um, the Israeli Water Authority alongside with the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Environmental Protection had decided to look for an engineered solution that would provide um, SAT equivalent water that can be used in the same water line under the same regulations for irrigation in the Negev region uh, in the south of Israel. Um, the, for, the Water Authority formed a war group dedicated uh, to the selection of the engineered solution uh, that included uh, representatives from the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Environmental Protection, and Mekorot. And uh, Mekorot was asked to pilot uh, a selected technology. Next, please. Um, our current regulations do not include a definition for reclaimed water. Uh, we have a definition for tertiary effluent, which are used for unrestricted irrigation, but we do not have a definition for reclaimed water. Um, so before deciding on a technology, um, our Ministry of Health had to define uh, water quality goals for the engineered solution to meet in order to be considered as a SAT equivalent. And those, and those goals are what you see in front of you. Uh, the, the selected treatment has to include uh, 10 log removal for viruses, eight, eight log removal for cryptosporidium and giardia. We have to have at least barriers with at least one log removal credit for uh, each of those pathogens. And we have to be able to remove at least 80% of trace organics from a pre-selected list. Next, please. Um, and of course, the selected technology also has to be affordable. Uh, we want it to have a minimal impact on the environment and uh, it has to be uh, to meet a certain quality to be delivered through the same lines as the, the reclaimed water that are produced um, from the site. Next, please. So what you see in front of you is that technology that was uh, the treatment train that was selected for piloting. Um, it's important to stress that the goal is to produce reclaimed water and not potable water. So uh, we do welcome some nitrogen, for example, um, in the final product. Um, the heart of the, pro of the process um, the pilot is uh, ozonation and backfiltration for both uh, disinfection and the removal of trace organics. Uh, 
um, the first uh, step of the process is uh, low loaded or tertiary MBR uh, because currently the Shafdan secondary effluent are not fully nitrified and we needed a process to complete the nitrification process and um, reliably produce uh, effluent with uh, turbidity below 0.15 NTU, um, which is what the Ministry of Health requires as a precondition for ozonation. So basically the treatment train that we selected, um, that was selected, um, applies some sort of an indirect potable reuse protocol, but for irrigation. Next, please. Um, just to note that we considered a few other alternatives, um, but, the, but the work group decided to pilot uh, the treatment train that I just showed you that includes that after secondary effluent includes uh, tertiary MBR, ozonation, um, back filtration, and UV disinfection. Next, please. Um, since a large scale application of, of this type of treatment train is new to us, we contacted uh, those who are more experienced than us. Uh, we had a wonderful team from Corolla uh, who visited us at the Shafdan and worked hand in hand with us to help us learn a lot about the different aspects of operating, operating such systems and uh, helped us to make sure that the selected treatment train actually made sense. Next, please. Um, a group of us also went on a tour to visit plants with uh, similar technologies in the US. And this is a good place to again mention the close collaboration uh, the whole process requires and re required and requires between um, Mikorot, which so-called the executive branch of the Water Authority, uh, and the different relevant government offices, uh, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Environmental Protection, and the Water Authority, um, as, well, as well as uh, several consultants um, who joined us on this trip and are continuously working uh, with us hand in hand um, on this project. Next, please. And last but not least, uh, we also commissioned a um, super professional NWRI panel to assist us with our work, with our work plan and uh, general assessment of our selected um, treatment train. Next. So status-wide, um, our pilot is already commissioned. Um, it's already um, starting to work. We're starting to collect data from certain parts of it. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing some interesting results coming in in the next few months. So the last thing I want to touch on um, um, in my talk is about the location of this pilot facility as part of Mikorot's uh, Research and Development Center for Effluent Treatment and Views at the Shafdan. Next, please. Mikorot has been actively involved in, in R&D activities in the, in the reuse field for many years now. Uh, we see it as an, as an essential component um, to make sure we're ready for tomorrow's challenges. challenges. Um, just for example, uh, with, with the pilot I just described, we had experience, experience operating um, ozonation and back filtration in that, in that context from previous um, research prog uh, programs we participated in that prepared us for the day we would have to apply that technology. Um, specifically at the Shafdan, we have been operating a research facility for more than a decade. Um, and we've been using it to test uh, many new technologies uh, with the help of our dedicated staff. Next, please. Um, a large portion we have of the research we have been carrying involves international collaborations. So for example, now we have a new collaboration with an impressive list of US and, inst and Israeli institutes uh, that is funded through the Bird Foundation. Our project is called Forward and it uh, deals with um, energy efficient wastewater treatment and effluent reclamation. Uh, it started um, in August of last year and we're very excited about this collaboration and Again, we're looking forward to uh, joint experience that will be coming in the next four years. Next, please. And we also constantly look at what's happening in the water sector uh, in the international scene. And currently we take a lot of interest uh, in seeing what comes uh, of President Biden's uh, spending plan for the water sector. Um, we have um, 
interest, knowledge, and experience in, in, we feel like we have interest, knowledge, and experience in many relevant fields. Some of them are highlighted in front of you. Um, next, please. And uh, we would love the opportunities, opportunity to, part, uh, to collaborate with uh, partners um, from the US and, and other places, of course, on different topics that are related to water reuse and, uh, and other topics as well. Um, many thanks for your time and attention again for inviting us to speak on this event. Thank you, Adas, for this outstanding presentation, demonstrating the implementation of uh, policy, standards, science, technology, and infrastructures in one side, the Shafdan. Uh, also giving a sense of great collaboration uh, with partners. Uh, we'll meet Adas uh, later in the discussion panel with the rest of our speakers and panelists. In uh, the bridge between recent research and development, technology and implementation, we would like to dedicate the next five minutes to discuss one of the bilater bilateral collaborative models uh, for water reuse innovation. I am delighted to invite Dr. Eitan Yudelevich, the CEO of Bird Foundation. Eitan, please. Omer, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. So next, please. So next, so thank you very much uh, for having uh, me here. Um, I'm going to present a, mo a cooperation model called BIRD, uh, it's an acronym, Binational Industrial Research and Development Foundation. Um, just now, a couple of minutes ago, uh, Adas mentioned BIRD, and I will also touch on that cooperation that was mentioned in the previous presentation. Uh, Bird, uh, Bird's mission is to uh, stimulate and promote a joint R&D between the US and Israel, US companies and Israeli companies, uh, and also research institutions uh, for mutual benefit. Uh, the two most important words here are mutual benefit. We have, uh, established, we have an established and uh, relatively stable uh, funding coming from an endowment. And on top of that, there's annual funding uh, for specific uh, programs. Next, please. So we have a board of governors, uh, like a board of directors, composed of uh, uh, representatives from the US, senior representatives from the US, government representatives, I'm from Israel. In the US is uh, Commerce, Department of Commerce, NIST, uh, State Department and Treasury. And in Israel is the Ministry of Economy and the Ministry of Finance. The Israeli chairman is also the chairman of the Israel Innovation Authority. Next, please. So in addition to the main program, we have uh, other programs which are focused on specific subjects. Uh, Bird Energy since 2009, Bird HLS uh, since 2016, and also the US Israeli Energy Center uh, since 2019, 1819. And uh, this, uh, the, the US Israeli Energy Center has a topic a energy water nexus in which uh, there is a consortium led by Ben Gurion and Northwestern University in which uh, there are 13 entities, including Mekorot and including, uh, for example, the Argonne National Lab and the uh, utilities and the companies like DuPont. And they're among other subjects, they're of, of course focused on wastewater or water reuse. In bird energy, there's also a uh, a topic uh, water energy nexus. Uh, so water projects can be submitted to that program as well. Next. So since, since uh, the establishment uh, of BIRD, more than a thousand projects have been approved, more than $10 billion in sales uh, from successful projects and about 26% uh, of our projects uh, since 2006 are in energy, water and environment. Next. So if you look at the spread of, uh, in the US, the spread of projects is all over the country. Um, almost no state is uh, without projects here. And we are also looking, we're always looking to expand this beyond what you see in the chart. Next. So we, if you look at projects, generally a bird project is two companies, a US company and an Israeli company. And here you have three examples of uh, projects that uh, water projects among uh, uh, many that were funded by the Bird Foundation, can do a company that will be presenting uh, after me, 
uh, with the US company Water Analytics, a project uh, focused on Tandus technology, small city organic wastewater management system. Iosite with American Water, a well-known uh, US utility, uh, focused on small water management system. And a recent project uh, between Netafim and the uh, own vector, a US startup, uh, focus on uh, advanced uh, world water filtering based on uh, pulse electric field. Next. So a bird project, and this is uh, important for this discussion because what you can do uh, with bird is uh, R&D, true, but you also can do demonstrations, you can do uh, piloting of uh, technologies. So for example, you can have an Israeli company with an uh, interesting technology uh, uh, partner with a US utility and uh, test uh, the, the technology to see if it fits the US environment. We have had such projects in the past. So we can provide up to a million dollars per project as a grant, a conditional grant, not more than 50% of the total uh, cost of the project. So there, there's a cost sharing, there are matching funds and, uh, and the million dollars is without any a requirement of uh, equity or any IP right. The conditional grant, and I, I don't have to explain uh, because of the five minute limit, but conditional grant means that if you're successful, if the project is successful, there is a repayment mechanism, but it's a very fair way of funding uh, joint technologies. The funding, as I said, comes from both countries. So uh, both companies or both entities need to uh, share uh, the funding. Next. So if we look at what companies say about uh, this mechanism, there's an impact study that was performed uh, last year and uh, with uh, 10 major benefits came up, six for the companies. And you can see that the three main uh, company level benefits are risk sharing, of course, because we provide the funding is a very important part of uh, what we do. Improved partnerships, we're very focused on helping companies in their partnership. Even before the project starts, uh, we um, help companies find partners. So we, we are matchmakers. And then the third one is access to innovative technologies, a very relevant uh, benefit for this discussion because if there is an Israeli company with a very interesting technology, you can use the Bell Foundation to, uh, as I said, test it, demonstrate it uh, in the US. And finally, at the national level, uh, the foundation is considered uh, very important to the strengthening of government uh, R&D collaboration. Next. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eitan, for enlightening us with this so important model that allows practical collaboration between our countries. And I hope that water reuse will keep occupying BIRD's funding grants. Next, please. Water reuse challenges demand cutting edge technology and Israel is the home for global developments. To moderate the technology session, I would like to invite Gali Fuchs, the director of Water Edge IL community. Water Edge is a government initiative of the Ministry of Economy, Israeli Water Authority, Israeli Innovation Authority and the Kinneret Academic College. Water Edge IL creates a network of professionals, entrepreneurs, researchers, and regulators to promote partnerships, innovation, creation, and adoption in, what, in the water industry. Gali, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Omer. Hi, everyone. I'm sure many of you read Seth Siegel's book, Let There Be Water, about the stations of water innovation in Israel, beginning even prior to its establishment in 1948, and continuing with various uh, initiatives on some of them we've heard today and yesterday. This culture of innovation yielded two immense programs in the early 2000s. Israel New Tech, an engine for technology development, beta testing within water utilities and academy industry collaboration, and Watech, a dedicated division within Macroft aimed at solving the diverse challenges of the National Water Company by testing and implementing cutting edge solutions. These programs supported the growth and export of numerous Israeli water technologies. Inspired by this out of the box approach, 
of the water industry, the Ministry of Economy has launched in recent years 11 innovation communities in food tech, energy, cybersecurity, digital health, and many more. Water Agile and the other communities' role is to develop, connect, and position the Israeli ecosystem as a global leader. We have here three great examples of Israeli innovation along the water reuse stream. Without further ado, I would like to invite Ari Goldfarb, CEO of Kandu, to introduce Kandu's revolutionary technology for real-time network condition analysis. Thank you, Gali. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, we've been collaborating with the US market in the last years through Bird Foundation, Water Use Foundation, NWRI. And I wish we all met face to face, but that have to be wait for the uh, few more uh, months. Uh, wastewater reuse. So wastewater we reuse is when wastewater become a product. And as a, a product, we look at wastewater treatment plant as a production plant for fresh water. And as a production plant, the influent that coming into this treatment plant is uh, actually a raw material, a raw material in production plant and as, as an any product, the quality of the product depends on the quality of the raw material. That's why controlling the quality of uh, the influent to the feeding plant is so important. And controlling the quality of the feeding plant done by effective source control. Kandu is working on digitalized cities all over the world in the last 10 years. And through collecting data about wastewater quality from the collection system, we bring water utilities the ability to control their wastewater quality. In this presentation, I will show you in the next few minutes how uh, and what we can learn from the data about the wastewater quality in the cities. Next, please. Thank you, next. So the first thing that we can see that a lot is happening in the collection system. Some of this we are not aware even. This is the data that we collected from the influent to the treatment plant from online measurement of the wastewater quality. This can be done by uh, collecting data from 30 different cities in Italy, Israel, and Texas. And what we can see that there are an average between two to six pollution event, event of significant changes in the wastewater quality in the influent to the treatment plant. Some of these, the operator even doesn't aware of. Those events take place, some of them will take a few minutes, some of, the, some of them will take a few days, but in average, we see that those events take place between one hour to, to five hours, and, and it happens all the time. Next, please. So when we collected the data about what happened in the collection system, we've seen that those events come from, of course, from industrial source. Every different industrial sector or type of industrial source have a different type of behavior, a different type of pollutants, but they produce a different type of impact on the field plan and outcome of the uh, source water that we produce. Next, please. When we look at the data from the discharge point of uh, 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 the industrial sources, and here we look about hundreds of industrial sources from collection system data that we collected in the last 10 years, we've seen that there is specific behavior for each different source. For example, a metal planting uh, factory will have much more uh, uh, pollution events than pe petrochemical uh, source. And what we've seen is that uh, they also not, uh, also the time of, or, or the duration of those events is changing. So a metal planting will have around eight events per week that will goes around one hour each event. When petrochemical, for example, uh, industry will have around one or two events per week for average that will take much more longer. Next, please. So what are we doing right now and what is the industry is doing in order to control the wastewater quality? 
Almost every city in the world have a pretreatment program. In a pretreatment program, we go and manually, randomly sample the industrial sources, the significant industrial sources and other industrial sources in our collection system. When we do that and looking at our database about online measurement of uh, uh, industrial sources, what are the chances that we sample exactly in the time that those uh, sources have a, a pollution event? So those are between two to eight percent, uh, the chances that we are we're gonna sample in uh, the right timing. We've done this calculation based on a sampling of one a quarter uh, and random sampling of the industries. Next, please. So actually what we've seen that there's a lot of happening in the collection system uh, and, and we actually don't really know what happened. In, we, we don't have any control in what happens in the collection system in terms of the wastewater quality, which is a bit different by the way, in terms of uh, wastewater hydraulic, which we uh, uh, have a very good cover about what happens, but in the wastewater quality, lots of happening. There's a lot of changes in the wastewater quality, a lot of sources that discharge into the collection system and we don't know much. So we looked into our system in, in places that we work, in, in places that we are uh, uh, digitalized the collection system and we've, where we've seen two to eight events per week. And we know that in those systems that are well covered, we can find 70, between 70 to 90% of the sources of uh, that discharge into the collection system. Next please. The way to digitalize a collection system uh, is by first collecting the data. Collecting data, that means that we have to use sensor to measure the wastewater quality, to measure changes in the wastewater quality. We have the ability to trace uh, the source through taking samples. And we, have, we need to have the ability to communicate this data into the cloud. Next, please. If we have enough data about online measurement in the collection system and enough data about sampling uh, the collection system, we can start produce results. And results mean that we can identify source, we can identify events, we can identify source, and we can understand the impact of those events on the treatment plan. Next, please. And what happens when we start to know? The most important thing that happened is change of behavioral. The change of behavioral start with the change of behavioral of the utility that manage the collection system. They start to manage the collection system based on data. So when they see an event, when they see a change in the collection system, I, and I used to be a process engineer and feed plant, and whenever we have an upset, I have to call to the pre-treatment group and to tell them, okay, we have an upset, and now we have to trace the source manually in the collection system. The change of behavior means that now the pre-treatment group, actually the uh, management of the managers of, of the collection system can now call the treatment plan and say, okay, we see that there is a change in the collection in the wastewater quality. You have a pollution event that will reach the treatment plant in two hours, take the measure that enough that needed, and we are gonna communicate that to the industry. A change of behavior means also that the industry start to change the discharge because they are much more aware of what they are discharging now to the collection system. Next, please. And this is the result. The result that we see that based on data and based on knowledge, it's create an impact. And impact means that we see more than 50% uh, improval of industries in the collection system, the improval in the wastewater quality. And we see uh, around 50% reduction of loads into the treatment plant. So once we know what happens in the collection system, once we understand what happens in the collection system, we have the tool to control it, to manage it, and to bring results. And that means that we can have efficient and safer reuse that allow us to produce a better water. Next. So thank you all. I will love to share this uh, data with you and happy to answer your question in the chat. Thanks, Ari, for explaining about the importance and value of advanced detection upstream 
to, mi to minimize harmful effects on the treatment process and later on the environment. So Israel is defined by an integrated management of water resources, but it doesn't mean we don't have examples of decentralized treatment plants. Running them well with high efficiency and stability, low footprint and minimal environmental impact requires true brilliance. So I'd like to welcome Ronen Barkan to introduce Fluence Technology. Hi, hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you, Gali. Thanks everyone for the opportunity um, for this great and wonderful um, platform. Um, ne next, please, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, and one more. Perfect. So as Gali introduced me, my name is Ronan Barkan. I um, manage the commercial activity uh, for Fluence in North America. Um, Fluence in a nutshell is a uh, result of a uh, merger between two companies that happened that took place in July 2017. The two companies were RWL Water and MFC um, and essentially created in, uh, a, a company or conglomerate of six companies working together. Uh, two Israeli-based companies, two American-based companies, an Italian company, and, and, and an Argentinian company with a big manufacturing facility in China, uh, with over 350 highly trained water professionals and offices all around the world, um, and publicly traded in the Australian Stock Exchange. Um, so that's just in a nutshell. Please, next slide. So today, what I'd like to speak about is the... Um, I guess the, the difference and the drivers um, of two different approaches when it comes to treating wastewater. One would be a distributed approach um, versus a centralized approach. Next, please. Um, so when, you, we look at, <clears throat> when we look at wastewater treatment, um, we could basically treat it in two different ways. If you're uh, looking at, um, at the centralized approach on the left side of the screen, um, you're basically saying, let's have one centralized wastewater treatment facility where we will collect all the wastewater from the nearby or even more than the nearby as, uh, we've, as um, uh, the Shaftan case study we saw. Uh, it can be as 19 kilometers far, far away from the uh, source of the sewage and bring it all to one centralized location. That has um, obviously a few advantages such as, um, you know, from monitoring, uh, operating um, and regulation standpoint, everything is centralized in one location. So, you know, you don't need to monitor various different plants, uh, which can create quite a challenge on uh, the operating uh, entity that operates the area of the wastewater. Um, additionally, you can treat all the wastewater in one centralized location and then distribute it to one centralized location like the Shaftan story in Israel. But there are some um, disadvantage for that approach. Some of these disadvantage would be um, that you're spending about two thirds of the overall capital costs on um, piping and pumping before you're even building the plant itself. Um, on top of that, moving the water for such long distances uh, creates a huge energy expense, um, which is not 100% always necessary because especially when you reuse, you will typically have reuse opportunities right at the source of the sewage. So you end up moving water from one end, from the source of the you're, you're moving water as wastewater from what? From the source of the sewage to the treatment plant, you're treating the wastewater and then you're bringing it back to that source for reuse. So again, you're, you're spending a lot of um, energy on moving a lot of water. Um, it's highly expensive to maintain those long pipelines. Um, once you're building your centralized municipal plant, there is not a lot of flexibility and scalability that can be done because you build it out so much, uh, it's very hard. It's, it's like moving a big semi-trailer as opposed to moving a much smaller uh, motorcycle, if you would. Um, and it's mainly, it, it works very well for already well-developed urban areas. Um, but as we know, lots of the world is rural. Um, and in the rural world, uh, many times it just doesn't make a lot of sense um, to build very long pipelines. And we're talking more than 19 miles away or kilometers away. 
Um, and that would be going to the decentralized approach. Uh, the decentralized approach of treating wastewater basically says, let's treat it, let's treat the wastewater just near the source and then reuse it at the source. Um, the challenges of this approach in the past years was the fact that you ended up with many, many of these small little facilities and regulating them was a huge challenge uh, because it would require monitoring from multiple um, little treatment plants. It would require operators to drive around long distances to get to those plants. And not, as, not necessarily you would have a skilled enough operator at where that rural facility is. Um, but well, with- uh, You have about three, four minutes. That's okay. No problem, no problem. <laughs> Um, but with the years we've come to technology and in the next couple of slides, I will try to explain how technology enables us to build uh, decentralized facilities in a extremely um, robust um, and high and, and, and that produces extremely high quality effluent. Next, please. So basically the approach is to take the Lego, the building, the Lego block approach. The Lego block approach means that you're having different Lego blocks that could fit different applications. And once put together, you create a complete facility. So it's not one solution that fits all. You basically create different building blocks and putting together those different building blocks, you're customizing the solution to this specific rural application. Um, so it can be in the form of having a secondary clarification type of process. Next, please or it can come in the form of having an MBR type of process, a membrane type of process that would produce a much higher quality effluent. Um, I'll finish, uh, next please, I'll finish with the next two case studies. Um, sorry, one more thing, one more. That kind of demonstrate on how robust we can make the decentralized application. So one example is at Stanford Kodaiga Recovery C uh, Center in California where we've piloted a small uh, 3,000 gallons per day or 11 cubic meters per day uh, wastewater treatment plant where we've taken the wastewater of the Stanford University to treat it to extremely high quality. We chose the, mo the, ex the most extreme uh, effluent requirements in the United States. One is California Title 22, and the other one is Maryland ENR, Enhanced Nutrient Removal Requirements, and you can see it calls for three total nitrogen and 0.3 total phosphorus. And we wanted to do that in order to demonstrate how robust you can make decentralized wastewater treatment plant today with minimal um, operation and of course cost because technology enables us to do so. If it's remote monitoring, uh, which has developed quite a way, um, another interesting thing to see is the raw wastewater that we had received, which was extremely concentrated because you see more and more facilities, especially in California, that are going to, um, um, to uh, entities or facilities that con uh, consume less water on the source, but it makes the sewage much more concentrated, which makes the sewage treatment uh, application much more challenging. So here we need to go down, from example, um, 100 milligrams per liter of total nitrogen, all the way all the way to three milligrams per liter total nitrogen. Um, so that took place in Stanford in 2018, and obviously we were able to um, uh, meet our requirement. Next, please. Uh, Ronan, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Invited. One more, please, and I'll finish off. One more, please. One more, please. I'm sorry, I got muted for some reason. Thank you. And last but not least is a recent application in the oil and gas industry, which I'll finish with. I don't know how much, uh, how many of you are familiar with the operation of an oil and gas industry um, or setting up a new um, oil uh, oil rig. But at the end of the day, you're looking at less than 24 hours to set up an entire village from scratch. And that includes the utilities. Um, and this would be ultra decentralized application. And that's why I wanted to chose this. While it's only 5,000 gallons per day, we needed to treat it to a high quality uh, effluent that will enable the client to be able to um, dust suppress and reuse the, uh, the effluent. Um, and so to treat it to a high quality. 
the biggest challenge is that you needed to be able to install, commission, and run a wastewater treatment plant in less than 24 hours from the time that you get the call. And obviously, we were able to we are able to build these systems again because technology enables us to do it. And the and the reason I wanted to show this is to try to explain that nowadays it's completely possible to treat uh, uh, wastewater to extremely high effluent quality with low maintenance requirements, with extremely low operational needs, um, in, um, and having a robust robust process with um, minimum problems. Um, and hopefully that will give way for more decentralized applications, which at the end of the day are tremendously more economic from capital standpoint and as well as operational standpoint and, ser and, and create a much more sustainable solution. Um, I think that's the last slide. Thank you so much, Ronan. Uh, thank you for showing how a treatment plant can be light and modular so that a very quick remedy can be provided for environmental hazards and for highlighting uh, nutrient removal as well. Um, moving on, Leo Eshet is an expert of RO technologies and IDE's Pulse Flow RO is a great example of creative engineering to support potable water reuse challenges. Leo, the floor is yours. Right, thank you, Gali, for this nice introduction. And uh, as said, I will be talking a little bit about IDE's technology for water reuse. Um, I must say that even though Israel uh, is, a, is a world leader, I believe, in, in water reuse, it is mostly used, as already said, for agricultural purposes. And um, the, the fully advanced treatment as, as known uh, in the US isn't really being implemented in Israel. Uh, even so, IDE's technology is aimed for the world market um, and mainly also for the American market. And I would, uh, I would go into deep, deeper details on that. So next slide, please. And next again. All right, so just a few words about IDE. IDE focuses mostly on desalination. It started with uh, thermal desalination uh, in the 60s. And then as RO developed, um, uh, of course, uh, also, also uh, gone into the RO market and has built uh, some of the world's biggest uh, RO desalination plants uh, of seawater desalination. And also um, in the past few years, also gone uh, into the water use sector. So next, please. All right, so just a few words about the, the traditional water use process. So normally we take secondary or tertiary effluent, next. Then we go uh, through UF, RO, and uh, UVAOP. Then there are some variations, of course, to that, but that's the, the classic approach. Um, brine is discharged either to, to ocean or to, to deep well injection or other means. And the permeate goes, uh, if it is indirect potable reuse, mostly into injection wells and then it becomes part of the, of the natural water body and uh, being taken uh, next please, and then taken out uh, through the production wells. Next again, another one, please. <laughs> All right, so this is uh, what you see here is the, is the normal water use process. And normally what is being used, next please, is that um, we use chloramines in order to, to, to make sure and control biofouling productions in order, again, to make sure that biofouling uh, doesn't harm uh, or doesn't go out of control uh, in the UF and in the RO process. Next, please. However, chloramines, um, even though very useful in order to control biofouling, um, causes a disinfection byproducts, including NDMA and others, which are organic contaminants, which are generally limited uh, um, to very low amounts. Uh, NDMA is limited to 10 nanogram per liter in, in California and other places as well. And there is also a bunch of other contaminants that uh, may, or may also pass uh, through RO. Most of them are being degraded in the UV AOP process, but still would be, uh, would be better and safer without them. So uh, please next. So our approach is to avoid chloramine dosage, and we use other means in order to control biofouling. And, and I will uh, go into deeper, deeper, deeper details about that. And next, please. 
So what are the main limitations uh, for water use when we're talking about RO? Next, please. Main limitations are or main enemies for, for RO uh, when used in water use sector is the, is the fouling, biofouling, and scaling. And why is that? Fouling is usually occurred because the brine velocity in the pressure vessel in the last elements is quite low, meaning that the low, there is low shear force. There is just isn't enough force um, to, to slough off um, those, those uh, fouling particles. Same pretty much goes for biofouling. There is, um, there is standard and, and, and constant hydraulic and osmotic conditions which allow bacteria to proliferate. And lastly, there is the scaling issue. Um, and scaling uh, crystals form when, when there is long enough time in supersaturation conditions, which allow the crystals to form. Next, please. In PFRO, we tackle all of those limitations by not op operating in constant conditions. Rather, we operate in fluctuating conditions, both in terms of hydraulics and from uh, osmotic, uh, osmotic means. Next, please. So this is a standard, this is how a standard RO looks like. And typically in water use, we have two or three stages if we want to go to something around 85% recovery or so. And the reason that we design those systems in, in, in two and three stages in, or is in order to maintain a minimal brine flow uh, that is required in order to keep uh, the shear flow, shear velocity that we need. In pulse flow RO, we don't design with a stage design. Uh, next, please. We design as a single stage uh, system, rather, uh, rather than uh, controlling the shear velocity by having stages, we use a single stage and we, we control the brine velocity by moving from dead end filtration to continuous filtration. Um, next, please. Leo, and that's you how have it looks. Three minutes. Sure. So this is how it looks like. There is a brine, brine valve on the brine, there, uh, on the brine side. Next, please. And we open and close that. When we are in closed, uh, closed condition, all the water ends, ends up as permeate. Next, please. Then we open the brine valve and we allow all the brine to get out, creating a high shear force. This high shear force sloughs out biofouling parts and fouling. Next, please. All right, next. So what happens when you look at the concentration point of view, you see that it changes all the time. Next, please. And again, next. And again, next. All right, next. So this is what happens when you look in the, in the reality, you see that there is fluctuating pressure and flow conditions. And this is important because it makes life for bacteria much harder on the, on the membrane surface. Same goes for scaling. So next, please. And again, next, please. So what you end up with is that you are having a system that doesn't allow or allows only minimal scaling formation as well as fouling formation. And the other factor that happens when you, when you alternate a hydraulic and osmotic condition is that you don't allow the scaling to form because the, the time that you allow the, the scaling to form is very, very quick. You do not give enough time for scaling uh, crystals to form. We call, that, we call that the induction time. So we don't get to that point of the induction time. So the end, the end, of, the end uh, statement here is that the PFRO minim greatly minimizes scaling and fouling. Next, please. We implemented that uh, technology at Pismo Beach, California, we, where we implemented a demonstration facility that showed that we could operate there at around 86% recovery and operating at very high flux. Next, please. The other thing that we noticed there, which we, that we already knew that, uh, that uh, happens is that when you avoid having chloramines, you gain, more, uh, uh, you gain more log removal credits and you have less UVT uh, at the permeate side, meaning that you can reach the same log removal for one for dioxide and the rest, uh, using less, uh, less energy. Next, please. We operated the same system when we dose chloramine and we saw that in order to get 
uh, the half log removal of one for the oxen as required according to title 22 we needed almost 700 millijoule per square centimeter next whereas when we did not dose chloramine because we don't need that uh, we need only about 450 so that means that you save about 37 percent of the energy also in the last uv aop section so not only you don't create you don't uh, create ndma and others but you also save on energy and chemicals on the final uv aop process next please next okay and um, this is a quick uh, case study we recently uh, won a bid at uh, Cherokee in Arizona, where we are about to implement uh, the Pulse Flow RO technology. It is a 2.2 MGD facility. Um, its foot size is about uh, three, uh, 340 feet containers. It is going to operate at about 90% recovery, even up to 95%. Um, all a single stage design. So it is a very advanced technology that will en enable uh, the client there to operate at, uh, at extremely high recovery um, in a very small uh, footprint pretty much uh, and have enjoyed all of those benefits. Next, please. So I will, I will quickly summarize the, the benefits of PFRO. So since it is a single stage design, we can also operate at much higher flux. That means that you can gain more water from your system, from your from the same system, up to 50% higher flux. Next. From OPEX point of view, we don't dose chloramine, so we're having savings uh, on all of those uh, fixed costs that uh, that you normally need uh, to invest, and you can gain more because you, again you operate at higher flux. Next. The overall water price may be reduced up to 25%. Next. We can get to very high recovery, like in, in Cherokee, where, where, where we are about to operate in 90% recovery. Next. And we get very high UVT, meaning that uh, there are significant savings on the UV AOP process. Next. <clears throat> It's a chloramine free process, so it's more environmentally friendly, no disinfection byproducts. Next. And next again. Okay, and that's it. So I'm sorry, but this was a little bit quick uh, in order to be able to really go into the deeper details of the technology. If there are any questions, I'll be happy if you would approach me later, or I can also uh, answer some questions in the chat. chat. So thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much, Leo. Thank you. Um, it's amazing to see how controlling the hydrodynamic conditions of, of the system can greatly influence the membrane phalanx interaction. Um, so dear audience, uh, we finished this part and feel free to reach out and share questions with these technologies representative in the following Q&A panel. Thank you very much, uh, Gali, Ari, Ronen, and Leo for demonstrating how tech and innovation can change the reality of treating wastewater. Um, our desk and team of experts are answering many questions in the Q&A function, and you are, you are invited to uh, raise more, uh, more, more questions of interest. Um, one of the uh, greatest op opportunities of this water we use virtual tour is to have a joint US and Israeli experts uh, dialogue. I am uh, pleased, pleased uh, to invite Dr. Rabia Chowdhury, um, national water reuse expert at the US Environmental Protection Agency to lead the Q&A discussion on approaches to water reuse implementation, technology and mechanism. Dr. Chowdhury and panelists, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Omar. Um, that was such a great session. I personally learned so much uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, the discussion with the panelists. Welcome back, uh, panelists. Um, we have a robust conversation and questions going on in, in the chat. And I will try to incorporate as much as uh, I can during this session. Uh, so I'll start with um, bringing a little bit of the U.S. perspective here. One of the challenges we face in certain parts of the U.S. is the seasonal mismatch between the water needs of crops on nearby agricultural land and the year round production of recycled water from a wastewater treatment facility. Um, and uh, yesterday and today we heard a little bit about how you uh, utilize uh, aquifers for storage. 
Um, but we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, is this a con uh, how do you are there any other concerns with this uh, in Israel? And um, also, really importantly, have farmers changed their practices because of the availability of water year round? Uh, and what are the overall impacts? Uh, another question that we uh, had internally was. Uh, have you seen any benefits in the form of reduced fertilizer use by farmers uh, using recycled water containing uh, some nitrogen? Um, Hades, you mentioned during your, your pre presentation that you uh, tailor your nitrate and your nitrogen levels. So uh, one of the questions we also received from the chat was what nitrate levels do you target uh, for, for treatment? So that's a, a bunch of uh, issues, but um, I would open it up to any of the panelists to answer. I think I'll start. Uh, thank okay. you, Rabia, for that. Uh, it really, it's a bunch of questions. And, you know, it is. Of course, uh, yeah, we kind of uh, presented the, the whole uh, IWRM, which means that we are dealing in a system that is uh, complicated. And, of course, you know, the picture is not so uh, pink or so green. It really depends the SEO point of view, but really, if we are doing and using 86 or 87 percent of reused water, we need to take care and to need and to see that we can use it all year round, which means actually that we need to build up a pretty big amount of reservoirs. And those reservoirs are a, something that we are doing on a national level, uh, they are throughout the whole uh, state with more than uh, 300 to 400 reservoirs, different sizes between small reservoirs such as uh, 100,000 uh, cubic meters into a few millions. Uh, they cost quite a lot, but they, uh, as far as we are having quite a lot of reservoirs, we have the flexibility to deal uh, on a yearly uh, circle uh, the amount of water that we are using and use it uh, almost all year round. You need to take into consideration that we are, as uh, Danny mentioned beforehand, uh, we are using it mainly in the Negev, which is mostly desert and the amount of rain over there is pretty low. So we kind of uh, irrigate the almost all year round, which means that we can really use the water properly. The thing is that uh, we need to take uh, in advance some calculation and some of the problems that we are uh, having nowadays is that, that, that we have more effluents that we can uh, treat or even uh, take uh, to those reservoirs and we don't have enough reservoirs, which means that some of the effluents going via the rivers and the streams into the sea. This is, of course, environmental uh, issues, not such, uh, not just a, a problem of the water sector. And it's also a, quite a lot of uh, perspectives in terms of health, because for example, uh, there are places uh, where the water line and the water pipes that are taking the desalination uh, treatment plants, uh, pipelines of the source need to be aware of the effluents that we are putting into the river and then to the sea. Uh, to conclude this, I, I would say that uh, the system is mainly, uh, of course, centralized in terms of reservoirs, and we are dealing with this. Uh, it's not uh, without any problems, but uh, as far as we are doing and integrating water uh, resource management, this is part of the system that we need to take into consideration. I think that uh, probably David will talk a bit about the nitrite and one of the bunch of the questions, although probably, Rabia, you have some more. Thanks. Thank you. So it does sound like with the um, position, having these reservoirs is one of the solutions you use to adjust the seasonal mismatch. Um, David, would you, or Hadas, I'm not sure which one of you wants to tackle the n uh, nitrogen question and the use of uh, nitrogen by the farmers and any of the changes in farmer practices? 
I think uh, this is best for Danny, please. Okay. Um, okay, well, we'll get the bright, the good answer we'll get tomorrow is tomorrow we're talking a lot about agricultural research, but uh, I'll give, uh, I'll start the answer today. Uh, um, when we use, in the past, when it was very common to use secondary uh, uh, quantity, then the levels of nitrate were, were quite high and the farmers definitely reduced their, uh, reduced uh, the uh, uh, fertilization um, because it was based on the nitrogen in the treated wastewater. But uh, our new standards uh, um, request uh, uh, removal also of nitrogen from the treated wastewater because the nitrogen, when you give an agricultural uh, practice, you need it at a certain season. You don't want it all around year. Uh, we saw even uh, uh, cases, for instance, in uh, grapevines, that if you gave high levels of nitrogen to the whole season, then you had a lot of vegetation, but it, but it didn't come to, to but the yield was lower. So you, you need the fertilization when you want it. We also have a problem of high nitrate levels in groundwater. And if you're giving the nitrogen all around year when you don't want it, then uh, the plants will not use it and you'll find it in the groundwater. So the standards, uh, I think we're down to 10 milligrams of, of, uh, uh, of nitrate, if I remember correctly, which still enables the farmers to reduce, uh, uh, reduce the, uh, reduce the uh, fertilization, but not as much as it was in the past. Um, if you asked about uh, farmers' patterns of using of water, well, we, uh, we have about, we're trying to get to reservoirs of about 35 to 40% of the amount of, uh, of uh, total water use, because that's about what is uh, produced in the winter in Israel, in the rainy season. In the rainy season, people don't use water, treated wastewater because they base it on rain and there's no reason to use it. You know, you wouldn't waste energy to, to irrigate when you have rain. We do see uh, uh, um, crops coming in on the uh, boundary, uh, boundary uh, uh, seasons, not only in the middle of the summer, but have it in the fall and in the, in, and in the spring, um, mainly by trying to reduce the prices. Uh, some of the farmer associations, they'll sell you in, 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 in these seasons, you'll keep, be able to buy the water in a lower cost because it saves the, 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 the farm association the cost of building the reservoir. And the reservoirs are really very expensive. So we will see more crops going in and then the demand for water is, is more even during the different mo uh, uh, months. And then the, all the infrastructure is much easier and cheaper to build. Thank you, Danny. That's really, really enlightening because it demonstrates the challenges of balancing these multiple different needs. Rabia, um, I... Rabia, it's alone again. Yes. I just said that nowadays, actually, even tomorrow, mm -hmm. we are doing an interministerial committee to deal with the nitrogen issue, which means that many, hopefully in the, few, in the next few years, will get into uh, some legislation that will say, okay, before you're having any crops, you need to... Uh, actually to find out and to monitor the, the soil itself. And as far as the soil doesn't need so much uh, nitrogen, you don't need to put so much, but it will take a few years, that's for sure. Really interesting, thank you. This is definitely an open area of, of research. Uh, so moving on to the next question. Um, this is a question about Shafdan. Uh, recycled water from Shafdan is biologically treated through activated sludge, um, so nitrogen removal, and then it is surface recharged into the aquifer as soil aquifer treatment. Uh, can you share some of the operational challenges of continuously using aquifer recharge at this scale for decades? Uh, what are some key lessons? Um, have you experienced any mobilization of naturally occurring um, arsenic, manganese, fluoride, or other constituents in the aquifer, um, your, your experience of using uh, SAT for such a long time is uh, really something of interest. And I'm going to add one other question from the chat that seemed to line up with this one. Uh, does the regulation include micropollutants, uh, for example, uh, farmer residues, and what the response of big wastewater treatment plants is to this issue, kind of uh, believing, including in the SAT? Um, Hadas, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, so I'll start from the end, or almost the end, and your question about mobilization of uh, arsenic, manganese, and I think fluoride you mentioned. Um, we we don't have much arsenic and fluoride in our in in the coastal aquifer where we apply the soil aquifer treatment. Uh, so it's not 
it's not a relevant question for that region. Uh, what we do have is manganese um, that is being mo uh, mobilized, mobilized in some places uh, where we apply solar aquifer treatment due to both um, reductive dissolution and mobilization. Um, it is an issue primarily for the farmers because it clogs their, uh, their um, irrigation infrastructure. Um, and we try to tackle this problem with, uh, with manganese mud, which is a technology that we kind of discovered that um, we have been developing and discovered that um, helps us reduce this problem. Um, and if um, uh, people are invited to contact us about it um, afterwards if they're interested. Uh, with respect to operational challenges, and of course there are many, and we are always trying to keep on our toes and, and learn new technologies and find new solutions to improve our performances. Our performance, um, for instance, um, one thing we've been trying to um, to do is to de develop um, modified infiltration technologies. Um, that combine different types of, um, of in situ pretreatments uh, with the solar aquifer treatment to, um, to increase the infiltration rate and improve the water quality even further. Uh, another issue we've been uh, facing uh, is clogging um, of, of the aquifer in the area of where we infiltrated, and um, we've been, uh, and which causes re uh, a reduced infiltration rate. Um, and we've been trying to tackle that by uh, modifying uh, the cultivation uh, methods that we use for plowing the soil, and we've we've seen quite a quite a bit of success with that um, in in recent years. We're actually now at a point where we're, we're approaching a point where infiltration is not the limiting factor, but rather the production from the aquifer becomes the limiting factor, um, or is another one of the limiting factors. Um, with respect to micropollutants, there are people here better equipped to answer this question for me than me, but uh, currently our regulations uh, do not include micropollutants uh, for reclaimed water, but we do, um, we do monitor uh, for uh, carbamazepine uh, in the SATs um, periodically. And our and the pilot that we're testing that I mentioned um, does include the ozonation and back filtration that will uh, remove a lot of the micropollutants there as well. Thank you so much, Alas. That was really interesting. Um, and yes, manganese does seem to be popping up everywhere, you know, in the US as well. There, uh, it, it is popping up quite a bit and it's an, it's an issue that, that needs to be addressed. Um, Danny, would you like to take a crack at this question as well? Well, actually, I would I would love to because 25 years ago, when I was a still a student in university, I was part of a team working for the Shafdan. That's where I, I, I got my master, and many friends of mine got their doctor doctor uh, degrees, their PhD degrees. Um, trying to see what are what is influencing uh, the the ability of the soil aquifer treatment, what will be mobilized and what will not, and we really predicted it was run by Professor Amos Banin. And we predicted that manganese will be a problem. And a few years later, abracadabra, it really was. And we predicted that heavy metals would not, uh, would not be a problem, and they still are not a problem. Um, I want to emphasize something that if you should consider. Uh, about five years ago, there was a change in the sludge treatment in the Shafdan, which influenced slightly the amount and in, 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 in formation of the nitrogen and, and it caused a chain reaction with a very big uh, uh, decrease in the ability of the soil aquifer treatment and the infiltration. And we had very big surpluses of wastewater, treated wastewater that we couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, uh, infiltrate. And uh, it was a real, real problem. And it took some time to realize what was going on and changing back in the, the procedure. And abracadabra, uh, uh, it came back to use. So you always in these systems, you always have to have research. You always have to have a very, very close eye on what's going on. Um, soil aquifer treatment, it's, it's a biology, it's chemistry, it's physics, it's the interaction between them. It's complicated and you have to constantly moderate it and try to figure out what is going on. But when you succeed, you get excellent water. Thank you so much. That's really, 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, the aquifer uh, treatment is so localized as well. It's very dependent on the individual aquifer, the individual conditions. So it's uh, really great to hear that, you know, all of this work that's been going on and the success that you've all had over the last several decades. Um, so I'm going to move on to another question. Um, so this is a more of a reflection question. Um, and then if we have time, I want to ask another question about effective source control, because there were a number of questions in the chat about that. So a bit of reflection question is knowing what you do know now, what would you do differently with respect to uh, foreseen or unforeseen obstacles um, from the utilities perspective implement and implementation of water reuse? Um, and for, for example, would your policy regarding uh, reuse be any different? Are there any drawbacks to the centralized planning and regulatory model uh, through the Water Authority Board that has been pursued in Israel? And what are your thoughts about opportunities, uh, challenges, and uh, collaborations going forward? So uh, one must ahead, remember uh, uh, that uh, the, our system is evolving from the beginning of the 60s uh, and at that time we didn't have a, any portable uh, reuse in uh, around the world but i don't think there would be much difference uh, between uh, uh, what we have today uh, uh, and what we would uh, decide i think uh, the the decisions were right i must say that uh, um, we at the ministry of health didn't agree to portable reuse of uh, treated effluent we thought, we thought that the, uh, using seawater is safer. Uh, and once again, it's, uh, Israel is, is compact, it's close to the sea. Um, treatment of, of uh, desalination is even cheaper than in the United States. So we uh, prefer uh, that kind of uh, uh, use. And, um, and we think that uh, the use in, in agriculture is uh, safer. Um, Gilad, would you like to take a stab at this question and reflect a little bit? I'm Gilad oh, with us. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, would anybody else like to uh, reflect on this question for a little bit before we move on to the source control question from the chat? So maybe uh, one word uh, about collaboration, Rabia. Okay. Um, although this is a great, very interesting uh, discussion, and it's not my expertise, but I want to add that uh, the Bell Foundation can be a facilitator to uh, for cooperation between uh, Israeli companies and the um, U.S. Uh, utilities or other uh, companies that uh, want to implement uh, technologies. So we are here uh, for anyone that is interested in uh, pursuing collaboration. And of course, also to discuss maybe additional models or additional uh, opportunities like we did with DOE or what, like we did with the DHS, okay? Thank you for that. And yes, um, thank you for sharing your, um, the, the collaboration model earlier today. That was really, really inspiring. Um, okay, this has been really great. So in our last couple of minutes, I'd like to move on to some of the source control questions. Um, so we had a couple questions in the chat uh, related to this. Um, how do you regulate industrial consumers that are making internal water recycling and uh, discharge brine concentrate? Does the regulation include, oh, this one are, we already talked about. Um, and I believe this is a question from uh, the, one of the technology company, for one of the technology companies. How did you compare the number of industrial pollution frequency cases for Israel, Texas, and Italy, uh, since there are such huge differences? So um, open to the, the panel at this point. Rabia, can you please uh, uh, repeat the question, the first part? Um, how do you regulate industrial consumers? This is around source control uh, of industrial consumers uh, putting um, pollutants into the, the sewer, sewer shed. How do you regulate industrial consumers that are making um, internal water recycling and discharging um, pollutants into the, the sewers and 
what what else does that include? Um, one of the examples we talked about earlier was uh, uh, identifying that that boron from detergents was affecting uh, crops, and you know some steps that you all took to um, mitigate that. So generally speaking, if we can talk a little bit about source control in that space, I think that would be beneficial to the audience. Okay, we have regu we have regulation. We we had we had a few different uh, uh, stages of the uh, of the development of the regulation. We started it with uh, uh, um, with, with regulation, which was actually uh, uh, a criminal law, which if you would be caught uh, uh, disposing uh, uh, heavy metals, we had a criteria, and if you would caught be, be disposing, it would be a criminal law. But it wasn't very effective as taking a, a factory. Uh, to, to, to build a, a, a case well enough to go to court and prove what he was done was very, very difficult and it wasn't, it wasn't very effective. In 2011, about 10 years ago, we changed the system to a tariff system that uh, uh, um, the water supplier or the sewage collector will do a, uh, it will uh, moderate the, uh, the, the quality and depending on what you've uh, poured into the system, you will get a water tariff. And if and and there's there there are different levels. There's different levels depending on what you poured in, which is supposed to cover the cost. If you had a problem with pH or with uh, sulfide, which uh, will uh, bother the transfer system, then you have a price that you have to pay, which takes into consideration that the pipe system, will, instead of being instead of living forty years, will live less. If you put in uh, a salt or boron that will uh, damage using the, be a problem to use the water for agriculture, you will pay for the cost of diluting the, the treated wastewater so it will be suitable for, for, um, for the agricultural use, et cetera, et cetera. If you pour in heavy metals, you will pay more for the price that the, disposing the, uh, the sludge to a, uh, a hazardous waste, uh, uh, um, hazardous waste treatment plant instead of using it for agriculture. Um, and in this way, we, 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 we made a very, very efficient system that the, the, the municipalities or the, the, they have a very big interest in doing the monitoring because if they catch things, then they can collect the fee. The industry has a very good interest uh, um, to, to, to obey the regulation because if they get caught, it costs them a tariff. Um, and by this, companies like Kandu, which Ari was here talking about, um, um, we made a market. We made a market for, for, for these things because it was important and there was an interest for all sides to, to, to do the measurements. And actually, I would like if Ari could, could relate how he sees it from the private sector. I'm talking from the regulator. He's talking from the private sector. Yeah, thank you, Danny. I, I think the polluted pay principle works very well uh, controlling wastewater quality, um, but in order to make it happen, sometimes regulation is not enough. Uh, you can be okay by regulation and all the uh, pre-fitment uh, sampling and the sampling of the industry will be okay and the sampling in the influent and effluent uh, also can be okay because uh, they've been done in average time and, and, and not all the time. and some non-biodegradable pollutants are measured only once a month or once a, a week. So uh, everything could be looked okay, but once you go to a reuse a project, especially when you talk about a portable reuse, direct or non-direct portable reuse, then all the things that are not working well are coming up. Uh, and then the controlling and, and gaining control and understanding what happens in the collection system then it's become a real, a real issue. I can give some example from the U.S. in some uh, portable, uh, non-portable reuse project and, and portable reuse project that are being designed. Uh, once uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the research went deeper and, and the engineering company researched deeper about the wastewater quality, then it found out that there is a lot of issues that are well covered by the regulator, regulation, but are not enough covered in order to make sure that there's a safe uh, water, uh, uh, water uh, quality. So regulation is, is important, it's, but when you go to, uh, the, especially in direct and indirect portable reuse, you need to do more than regulated in order to make sure that you have safe uh, wastewater quality. 
Thank you so much, Danny and Ari. That was really interesting and um, absolutely key ideas in, uh, around source control and protecting the, the resource, uh, the sewer, uh, the wastewater in the sewers that will become water for somebody else, protecting that, uh, that resource and uh, making sure that uh, pollutants monitoring it and then regulating it in a way that those uh, pollutants don't make it into water that will be reused. Uh, so that's all the time we have. We're actually just a few minutes over, but we're going to wrap up right here. Thank you again so much to all of the panelists for your very thoughtful answers. And um, this was such a pleasure to be able to bring some of these things into light. So I will now turn it back over to Omar. Thank you. Did we lose Omer? Okay. Um, I, I don't see him. So I think I'm just going to close it out in case, uh, Omer, please, if you jump in, uh, please feel free to, to jump in and close it out. Uh, but this is from the Israeli side. Thank you so much to all the speakers and guests. Uh, please join us tomorrow to discuss the uh, the next, the final session, increasing agricultural irrigation efficiency through recycled water. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about uh, the Israel EPA uh, and Israeli Ministry of Environmental Protection, MOU, the website is right over here. And please, for more information for water reuse and the water reuse action plan, visit our website and uh, you can contact EPA's uh, water reuse at epa.gov. Uh, just a quick note about the questions in the chat. Uh, this group has been very, very uh, thoughtful and careful about collecting the uh, questions that are popping up in the chat. And we, uh, the, the team here will strive to respond and get back out to uh, everybody else, who, else who's joined. So thank you to the audience. We will see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.